2015 meeting of the Federal Communications Commission will come to order. Madam Secretary, will you tell us what's in store for us today, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and good morning, Commissioners. For today's meeting, you will consider a report and order and second further notice of proposed rulemaking that would leverage innovative spectrum sharing technologies to make 150 megahertz of contiguous spectrum, spectrum available in the 3550 to 3700 megahertz band for wireless broadband and other uses. This is your agenda for today. Please note the public notice requesting further comment on issues related to competitive bidding proceeding was adopted by the Commission and deleted from today's agenda. Today's item will be presented by the Office of Engineering and Technology and the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau and is entitled Amendment of the Commission's Rules with Regard to Commercial Operations in the 3550 to 3650 megahertz band. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Sherman, take it away. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Good morning. I'm joined at the table this morning by Julie Knapp, Chief of OET, Ira Kels, Deputy Chief of OET, John Leibovitz, Deputy Chief of Wireless Bureau and the Chairman's Spectrum Advisor, and Paul Powell, an attorney in the Mobility Division of the Wireless Bureau. Before I turn this over to the 3.5 team, I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize John Leibovitz for his extraordinary work and leadership on this item. John has taken this new idea from concept to reality. He has been its chief advocate and driving force. Our agency is lucky to have a policy thinker with John's intellect and talent, not to mention his commitment to public service. John and Can Paul. Can we get our first 5 0 vote on that this morning? <laughs> that <laughs> John and Paul will present the item. Thank you. Um, thank you, Roger. Thank you, Commissioners and Mr. Chairman. Um, the the 3.5 gigahertz discussion has benefited enormously from the expertise of a huge number of people inside and outside of government, and I want to take a moment to acknowledge just some of them. Uh, first, we would like to thank the many people in the NTIA the DODCIO office, the Navy, the, and the Army who work behind the scenes to propose a new sharing paradigm. And these include Fred Moorefield, Tom Taylor, Bob Schneider from DOD, Paige Atkins, Peter Tenhula, and especially the indefatigable Ed Drisella from NTIA. And some of these people are here in the room today. Uh, additionally, in, in addition to the people here at the table, I wanted to just thank um, some of the FCC staff who contributed to the item. And these include uh, Kamran Etemad, Joyce Jones, Wayne Layton, Elliot Maynard, Gary Michaels, Roger Noel, Kelly Quinn, Brian Regan, Christian Sakura, Jim Schlichting, Joel Taubenblatt, and Margie Wiener from WTB, Navid Golshahi, John King, Uri Livnot, Bob Pavlak, and Mark Settle from OET, Chip Fleming and Bob Nelson from IB, and David Horowitz and Bill Richardson from OGC. Since we only have one item on the agenda today, I felt I took the liberty of that longest. Um, we want to thank all of the industry stakeholders and other commenters for engaging in a rigorous back and forth discussion that has culminated in today's rules. And the bureaus in would like to thank you, the chairman and the commissioners, uh, and your own staff for overseeing this amazing journey. Finally, I want to say a special word about Paul Powell. Paul has lived and breathed this project for over two years. He has been the heart and soul of the team and the power behind the pen. To put it in terms that Paul would relate to the most, he is the Luke Skywalker of 3.5 gigahertz. I'm not sure if that makes me Admiral Akbar. <laughs> so, I don't know if there was, tell me about the resemblance. Uh, we are lucky to have such a dedicated public servant always pushing to do the right thing. Paul will present the item, and I hope he will use the spectrum, Paul. Thanks, John. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. This draft report and order and second further notice of proposed rulemaking would create a new citizens broadband radio service for shared wireless broadband use of the 3550 to 3700 megahertz or 3.5 gigahertz band. The creation of the citizens broadband radio service was originally proposed in a notice of proposed rulemaking released in December of 2012. Since then, the record has been supplemented by a commission level public notice on licensing issues and two workshops to discuss technical issues related to the proposed service. In April of 2014, the Commission released a further notice of proposed rulemaking that included detailed proposed rules to govern the new service. This draft report and order builds on the Commission's prior actions and incorporates ideas submitted in the extensive record generated in this proceeding. This draft report and order would implement a three-tiered spectrum authorization framework to facilitate a variety of small cell and other broadband uses of the 3.5 gigahertz band on a shared basis with incumbent federal and non-federal users of the band. 
Access would be coordinated by a dynamic spectrum access system conceptually similar to, but more technologically advanced than, the databases used to manage television white spaces devices. The three proposed tiers are incumbent access, priority access, and general authorized access. Incumbent access users would include authorized federal and grandfathered fixed satellite service users currently operating in the 3.5 gigahertz band. These users would be protected from harmful interference from priority access and general authorized access users. We have worked extensively with NTIA, the Department of Defense, and the military services to develop a two-phase approach to protect incumbent federal radar systems while maximizing the utility of the band for wireless broadband services. In phase one, federal radar systems will be protected by exclusion zones that are significantly smaller than those proposed in the Fast Track Report and the FNPRM. In phase two, these radar systems will be protected by an environmental sensor capability that will detect the presence of federal radar transmissions and report such transmissions to the SAS. The priority access tier consists of priority access licenses, or PALs, that will be assigned using competitive bidding within the 3550 to 3650 megahertz portion of the band. Each PAL is defined as a non-renewable authorization to use a 10 megahertz channel in a single census tract for three years. Up to seven total PALs may be assigned in any given census tract, with up to four PALs going to any single applicant. Applicants may acquire up to two consecutive PAL terms in any given license area during the first auction. The general authorized access tier is licensed by rule to permit open, flexible access to the band for the widest possible group of potential users. General authorized access users are permitted to use any portion of the 3550 to 3700 megahertz band not assigned to a higher tier user and may also operate opportunistically on unused priority access channels. The draft report and order also includes rules governing the integration of the existing 3650 to 3700 megahertz wireless broadband service into the citizens broadband radio service and temporary protections for existing licensees in that service as well as high-level rules governing the operation of the spectrum access systems, provisions to protect FSS earth stations within and adjacent to the 3.5 gigahertz band, and technical rules for base stations and end-user devices in the band covering a wide variety of possible use cases and network deployments. Finally, the second further notice of proposed rulemaking seeks focused comment on three discrete issues. These issues are, one, additional protection criteria for in-band and out-of-band FSS earth stations, two, appropriate secondary markets rules for the band, and three, how to define whether PALs are in use at a particular location. The staff recommends that the commission adopt this report in order and second further notice of proposed rulemaking and request editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for all of your efforts that John has appropriately shouted out. Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you very much. Today marks a significant moment in spectrum policy because this morning we make a number of important paradigm shifts in our approach to find more spectrum for commercial wireless services and promote more efficient use of this valuable resource. In the past, our primary strategy for finding more spectrum for commercial wireless services was through NTIA identifying bands that could re be repurposed for federal use, from federal use. The often costs clunky approach in many cases took decades to bear fruit. This model was not a sustainable one because spectrum is finite and as consumer demand for wireless services grows exponentially, finding more bands to repurpose only becomes more difficult. Wireless consumers and forward-looking entrepreneurs deserve a new approach to spectrum management that is as tech-savvy and innovative as they are. Spectrum sharing is one such new approach. Driven by technological advances such as databases and environmental sensing, as well as good old-fashioned willingness, Mr. Chairman, to cooperate, spectrum sharing has become more acceptable to both the wireless industry and federal agencies. We are seeing databases that allow TV white spaces devices alongside broadcasters and medical body area networks sharing spectrum with aeronautical tele telemetry services. But the primary reason we can turn the page this morning and adopt a spectrum policy that leads with spectrum sharing is because of the tremendous cooperation between our staff leaders here at the Department of Defense and NTIA. 
Their work has led to substantially shrinking the protection zones for federal operations. Those zones in the 3.5 gigahertz bands were reduced by a whopping 77%. And Larry Strickling of NTIA, Fred Morfield of DOD, Julie Knapp, and John Leibowitz of the FCC deserve praise for their leadership in this effort. Another notable paradigm shift is a move away from the highly fragmented long-term exclusive use licenses to shorter priority access licenses with a rule to use it or share it with general authorized access users. These new regulatory approaches will create enough certainty to fuel investment in equipment for the 3.5 gigahertz band, and the new PAL license will have lower administrative costs and allow for micro-targeted network developments. Service providers will have flexibility in designing networks to address unique challenges posed by rule and other areas and by using a spectrum access system database to diametrically assign frequencies in the band for both PAL licenses and GAA users, there will be more efficient use of spectrum in heavy populated areas. In prior items, I have expressed optimism that our proposed technical rules could lead to interoperability by all commercial entities who choose to use this band. But a development late in the proceeding concerns me. Parties have expressed interest in deploying a version of LTEU license assisted access technology and some commenters hoping to deploy Wi-Fi technology claim a version of LAA is being deployed in the 5 gigahertz band that lacks 3GPP standards. They also assert that protocols necessary to coexist with Wi-Fi devices do not exist. Requests to formally coordinate with the relevant industry standard setting bodies they charge have gone unanswered. I remember all too well how the significant problem with the lack of interoperability in the lower 700 megahertz band that developed in the industry standard process affected auction number 73. Considerable time and effort was necessary to repair that technical impediment, resulting in spectrum remaining unused and investment being stranded. To guarantee that there is no deja vu all over again, I would have preferred that we ask questions about the LTEU LAA standards development process in a further notice. Cooperation is allowing us to vote, however, for a landmark spectrum management policies that we adopt today. And we anticipate the, spur the spurring of even greater technical innovation and in new business models. I caution, however, that we will not fully realize the benefits that the 3.5 gigahertz band holds unless there is a standard setting process that includes the cooperation of all relevant parties. I would like to thank this morning, as has been, uh, the, uh, I, I don't have a Star, Star Wars. Um, all I know is in December, we're all going to be happy. So, but we're happy today. <laughs> we're happy today. Uh, and thank you, Paul Powell, for your presentation and all of your hard work and the myriad of members of the staff for their incredible work on this item and contributions throughout this proceeding. May the force be with you. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Uh, today, we make history. We chart a new course for spectrum policy. That's because in the 3.5 gigahertz band, we adopt a creative three-tiered model for spectrum sharing and management. This is a paradigm shift that paves the way for new services, new technologies, and more mobile broadband. Now, to be sure, our decision is chock full of these small, complex details that only a spectrum geek could love. But this is big. With our work in the 3.5 gigahertz band, we leave behind the tired notion that we face a choice between licensed and unlicensed airwaves. That's because we create new spectrum licenses custom built for small cell deployments, and at the same time, open up more spectrum for unlicensed services the jet fuel of wireless innovation. Even better, 
We do all of this while protecting those already in the band, including military applications that help keep us safe. But today's success was not preordained. After all, when NTIA first identified the 3.5 gigahertz band as underused and suitable for sharing, the response was a collective shrug. Interest was not high because there were challenges presented by government users already in the band. To put it even more bluntly, when it came to making commercial use of 3.5 gigahertz, the consensus was this was a junk band. But instead of discarding this band as junk, we got creative. And as a result, this spectrum is now fertile ground for innovative new wireless services. Now, if this story sounds familiar, that's because it is. 30 years ago, we also had underused frequencies. At the time, they were in the 900 megahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, and 5.8 gigahertz bands. These were airwaves that had been assigned for industrial, scientific, and medical uses. But so little was happening in these airwaves, they were known in Washington as garbage bands. They were scraps of spectrum where a lot of experts concluded that the demand for wireless services would just be limited. But the commission back then refused to dismiss these bands as junk. Instead, it got creative. Rather than following the traditional route of providing licenses to allow single operators to control in these bands for specific purposes, it made them available to the public. As a result, three decades ago, the first significant swaths of unlicensed spectrum were made available in these so-called garbage bands. Now, a lot happened in the interim, including the development of an important standard, 802.11. But if you fast forward, you can see how this was the spectrum where Wi-Fi was born. And since then, Wi-Fi has become our on-ramp to the internet. It has become a platform for wireless innovation. An unlicensed spectrum is now responsible for billions of dollars of economic activity every year. You know, they say history repeats itself, and if that happens here, it would be a good thing. That's because in the 3.5 gigahertz band, we are building on the success of past unlicensed spectrum policy and finding new ways to push it into the future. This is exciting. But of course, it is not without its challenges, and we need to closely monitor the development of new unlicensed air interfaces. To this end, I appreciate that the chairman has committed discussing these issues in an upcoming public notice. I support this approach and hope that as we move forward, we can be guided by three simple principles. First, let's recognize that unlicensed spectrum and Wi-Fi is one of the great wireless success stories of the last 30 years. It's a story we want to continue. Second, unlicensed spectrum should be open to anyone who plays by the rules. This was the principle that informed our earliest thinking about unlicensed spectrum, and it should continue to inform us today. Third, existing users of unlicensed spectrum should be open to new innovation, and at the same time, new entrants should respect existing users. But back to the here and now. Thank you to the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau and Office of Engineering and Technology for your truly creative work in the 3.5 gigahertz band. If the future of unlicensed spectrum in this band is anything like the past, we can all look forward to new services, new technologies, and more mobile broadband. And cheers for that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Finding a way to put the 3.5 gigahertz band to its highest and best use has long been a challenge. Federal incumbents occupy much of the band. They make little use of the spectrum across large parts of the country, but their operations nonetheless have precluded others from using it. That's not efficient, to say the least. For, as Admiral Akmar might put it, at that close range, commercial users won't last long against those star destroyers. So for years, we have been exploring ways to allow this spectrum to be deployed for the benefit of consumers. After considering several outside-of-the-box ideas, we are moving forward with an experiment to see if we can make the spectrum more productive. 
Will it work? Have we struck a balance that will allow a variety of innovative uses to flourish? We will see. This order leaves many important details and complex questions to be resolved, including whether technologies will develop that can manage the com uh, complex questions and dynamic interference scenarios that will result from our approach. It therefore remains to be seen whether we can turn today's spectrum theory into a working reality. Moreover, exclusion zones still cover about 40% of the U.S. population, and we leave the door open for the introduction of new federal uses across the country, neither of which is ideal. Because I'm concerned that some of these decisions might hinder these types of investments and deployments necessary for this experiment to succeed, I'll be voting to approve in part and concur in part. But notwithstanding my concerns, there has been an awakening. And I hope that consumers in the years to come will feel it. Thanks to the substantial progress that has been made in this proceeding, they may. And I'd like to thank my colleagues for their willingness to accommodate some of my suggestions. First, by removing the 20 megahertz set aside that favored certain interests, we give everyone equal opportunity to access this spectrum and reduce unnecessary complexity. Second, the order now ensures that existing wireless internet service providers, or WISPs, can continue to deploy broadband to rural consumers, rather than freezing them out during the transition to a new 3.5 gigahertz regime. Third, the order provides somewhat greater incentives to invest in the band than were contained in the original draft. For example, instead of making licenses unavailable in many markets, the order now provides that they will be, will be available in every market where applicants express a demand. And finally, although the exclusion zones remain, the order now has a mechanism in place that hopefully will help in converting them to protection zones, which means that 3.5 gigahertz devices could then be used within those zones. Each of these is a pro-consumer, pro-competitive step that I'm glad we're taking together. Now, it bears mentioning that it could be years uh, before consumers see the benefits of this particular rulemaking. In the meantime, we must redouble our effort to free up additional spectrum for immediate consumer use. And the obvious place to look is the 5 gigahertz band. Since 2012, I've been calling for the FCC to make available up to 195 megahertz of 5 gigahertz spectrum for unlicensed uses. And I appreciate the work of my colleagues, Commissioner Rosenworcel and Commissioner O'Reilly, to highlight the importance of that band. The 5 gigahertz band is tailor-made for the next generation of unlicensed uses. Its propagation characteristics minimize interference in the band, and its wide, continuous blocks of spectrum allow for extremely fast connections, with throughput surpassing 1 gigabit per second. The technical standard to accomplish this, 802.11ac, already exists and devices relying on that standard are already being built. With the potential of 5 gigahertz spectrum within our reach, the time has come for the FCC to act, and I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues to reach a consensus. Finally, I'd like to thank the staff of the International Bureau, the Office of Engineering and Technology, the Office of General Counsel, and the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, in particular John Leibovitz and Paul Powell. The 3.5 force runs strong in your family, I sense for all the hard work that you've done in this proceeding. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excuse me. I'm excited about the possibilities that may arise from our action today. In sum, it will make available an additional 150 megahertz of spectrum for new uses, whether for small cell systems, wireless backhaul, or technology that's yet to be imagined, let alone invented. Let's just see what services our entrepreneurs and inventors can amaze us with using the two commercial prongs of the three-tier spectrum access structure. Although I support placing this spectrum into the marketplace and approve of this item in part, I do have some reservations about several of the rules that we adopt today, which I will concur in. What some have nicknamed the innovation band, 3.5 gigahertz, is a real-world experiment with so many components or variables. Sometimes, too much experimentation can harm and ultimately delay successful deployment of new services. I hope we have struck the right balance here, but only time will tell. First, I am pleased that my calls to reduce the exclusion zone size were heard. The exclusion zones adopted here today are 77% smaller than they were originally proposed. We must exercise diligence in ensuring that the zones continue to shrink. 
As I've previously suggested, these remaining exclusion zones must be converted into coordination zones, and the ESC system is poised to do just that. Second, I am concerned that some of our rules may hinder the development of the priority access licenses known as PALs. I question whether auctioning PALs for three-year terms with no renewable expectancy will create a meaningful incentive to entice auction participants. Similarly, I had hoped our rules would include a mechanism whereby any entity could receive a PAL even if mutually exclusive applications, which are necessary to trigger an auction, are not filled in a particular census tract. The Commission ought to encourage a diverse array of business models. Our rules must not foreclose those prospective licensees from obtaining PALs just because they're the only one in a given census tract wanting priority access. We need to fix this in the near term. Third, on a macro level, today's ruling relies on certain premises that I generally do not support. Spectrum aggregation <coughs> limits are not necessary in the 3.5 gigahertz band, nor is the Section 307E licensed by rule framework for GAA. Further, I oppose any attempt to ensnare 3.5 gigahertz offerings that resemble broadband internet access service under Title II or subject them to the requirements of the net neutrality order. For those of you that have not read the item, which is just about everyone since we haven't made it available as I would have hoped, we are electing to defer on several issues in this proceeding for the time being. Some final decisions will be made in response to the further notice accompanying this order. Some will be put in the hands of a multi-stakeholder group and others will be made in the context of future auction comment and procedures public notices. That means there's much work to be done in this area. Let me raise a couple of other points. Some people talk about the structure set up in this item as a new paradigm for a future spectrum. I think it's premature to go along this thinking, and I'm not convinced that it is a new paradigm. Instead, it will likely be one way among our existing structures that can be used in the more difficult situations where government users absolutely cannot move. As I have said before, spectrum clearing and exclusive licensing will remain in high demand as reconfirmed by our AWS 3 auction and likely by our upcoming incentive auction. Separately, the Commission needs to do more to facilitate the siting of small cell systems. Although we do not know the array of services that may develop, there is one commonality. They will not come to fruition without infrastructure. To ensure that the new services flowing, uh, flowing from this 3.5 gigahertz spectrum reaches the hands of American consumers as quickly as possible, we must remove burdensome roadblocks preventing installation of small cells, whether due to hyper-regulatory state, environmental, or historical review. Small cell infrastructure deserves the Commission's immediate attention. I thank the Chairman for incorporating so many of my suggestion, uh, suggested edits, including agree with me that the auction comment and procedures public notice should be voted on by the full Commission, and ensuring that SAS user information would not be stored and thus potential available, uh, pen potentially available for questionable purposes. Finally, I don't want to underestimate all the work that has gone into this effort, and I want to thank the Commission staff, which has gotten us here today. I thank you for all your hard work, and I yield back my time. Thank you, Commissioner. You know, since they uh, don't make Spectrum anymore, um, and since Spectrum is the pathway of the 21st century, we have to figure out how we're going to live with a fixed amount. And clearly sharing is key to that. And what we're doing today is, as been frequently mentioned, um, setting a new paradigm for how spectrum sharing should work. You know, two-thirds of the 150 megahertz that we make available uh, today was previously unavailable for consumer and commercial use because it was locked up by a single user, the Defense Department. This is changing today for two reasons. First of all is that advanced computing systems can now act like spectrum traffic cops. And it's appropriate that as we come up on the 50th anniversary of Moore's Law this Sunday, the power of Moore's Law is being demonstrated to us in how we can use and reuse and share this valuable natural resource. But the other factor that 
changed everything was the cooperation and leadership of the Defense Department. I want to particularly focus on that second point. Early in my uh, tenure in this job, I, I sat down with Secretary Hagel and, uh, and told him how impressed I was with the DOD's new enlightened approach to spectrum policy. And the reasons for that are many, starting with presidential leadership. But like everything else, it boils down to people. Uh, DOD CIOs uh, Terry Takai and Terry Halverson, Major General Robert Wheeler, but in particular, as we've heard many times up here today, two people in particular deserve a, a shout out. For without their hard work and commitment to find a solution, this simply wouldn't be happening. And of course, I'm talking about Fred Moorfield and Ed Drusala. This is something that I can tell you multiple, multiple, multiple times. I heard from staff, well, we're talking to Fred. <laughs> well, we're working through this. And that Fred and Ed were supported in this effort by the folks at NTIA um, with the firm hand of Larry Strickling, but the ongoing efforts of Peter Tenhula, the, the guy who makes things happen in this area. So um, what I've heard from these people continually is the important role that our um, federal partners have played in this, and I want to give a specific shout out to them and express our gratitude. And they happen to be here, so let's recognize them. Fred? Ed, come on, guys, stand up. Thank you for what you've done. And that is in no way to slight the incredible hard work of the people who sit before us. John, thanks for everything you've done. Paul, for your uh, perseverance throughout all of this. Roger, Julie, Ira, thank you uh, to all of you. There has been uh, also talk up here this morning about um, licensed assisted access technology, uh, which is now in the standards bodies uh, and its relationship to this spectrum. We want to make sure that we maintain our historical policy of technical neutrality, but we are very interested in what these developments are and therefore, within the next 30 days, we will be releasing a public notice that will allow interested parties uh, to inform us and to inform each other about what is going on in the standards making process and how this issue uh, relates to um, the, both this particular band of spectrum as well as to other bands of spectrum that have been uh, mentioned today. That'll be coming out uh, in the next 30 days. Uh, and so with that, I will call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. The request for editorial privileges is granted. Would, uh, with the exception of uh, Commissioner O'Reilly dissenting, um, would any of my colleagues like to make announcements? Commissioner Clyburn, we'll do this in Peck. Commissioner Rosenworcel, go for it. Oh, uh, I just wanted to make a chewy baka kind of a comment now. I mean, oh, we're home. You know? Yes, indeed. Um, you have seen the preview, I hope. I have seen the preview, and I'm really worried about Darth Vader looking so old. <laughs> you know, the age thing is something that I'm particularly sensitive to, and if Darth <laughs> Vader can look that bad as he ages. Uh, I know. What does it hold for us mere mortals? <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, hopefully, uh, it'll be a good movie, but time will tell in about eight months. Um, I just want to take a couple of minutes to uh, <laughs> bid a fond farewell to the law clerks in our office and for all the great contributions they've made. Uh, it's been a busy couple of months, uh, to say the least, and there's no way we could have done what we've done uh, without their efforts. I'll start with uh, Nathan Egan. 
Uh, Nate worked on a wide variety of issues from the effective competition and market modification and PRMs implementing the delightfully acronym STELLAR uh, to an obscure item about something called net neutrality, uh, where he focused on the notice section of our dissenting statement. Uh, next month, he'll graduate from George Washington Law School, and while we are sorry to see him go, the good news is that after he takes the bar, he'll be coming right back here. He's going to be one of our honors attorneys here at the FCC. And coincidentally, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to put in a unanimous re 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 consent request to have an honors attorney assigned to our office this fall, if that would be possible. Uh, just take it under advisement. That's all I'm do asking. Do they have to wear yellow ties today? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Apparently they do, yes. Um, uh, Andrew uh, Promschufer is finishing his second year at Georgetown. He worked at several uh, on several items, including net neutrality and the Section 706 report. He also he helped me become an expert in Canadian radio for this past winter's uh, North American Broadcasters Association Symposium in Toronto. In addition to his research and writing skills, important, yada, yada, Andrew possessed the most important attribute for working in our office, a broad range of uh, pop culture knowledge. For example, we, d we told him earlier this week that Scott Foley hosted the TV luncheon at the NAB show. Andrew not only knew that Scott had starred in the, over a decade ago in the WB television sh show Felicity, he also informed us that Scott was on Team Noel, uh, which is impressive. I'm grateful for Andrew's service on our team, and I wish him all the best as he heads into the private sector to work at a firm this summer. Uh, next up is Max Hsu. Max joined our office back in August, uh, which, as would suggest, came back for more uh, for the winter. Uh, and from drafting op-eds and statements to reviewing items, Max has been an integral member of our team for the past eight months. At the beginning of this year, for example, uh, when most of uh, the folks in our office were focused on net neutrality, he stepped up and took the lead on the municipal broadband item. And we could tell that he was persuaded by the state of Tennessee's position when he started walking around singing Rocky Top around the office. <laughs> and, uh, Max also worked on over-the-top uh, regulation of video, the designated entity rules, and a number of consent agenda items. And moreover, no slight to him, he is not a slouch in the pop culture department. The day after Zane announced his departure from One Direction, I kid you not, he told us that it was raining outside because God was sad. <laughs> Well, we are sad that Max is leaving uh, to us today, but like Harry, Liam, Niall, and Lewis, we will do our best to carry on. Like Nathan, Max will be graduating from George Washington in May, and I'm confident that he has a very bright career ahead of him. Uh, finally, I want to recognize Chris Mills, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today. I would feel sorry for him, but he's actually in a wedding in Palm Beach this weekend. Uh, Chris is finishing his second year at Catholic, and I appreciate all of his efforts on issues ranging from net neutrality to indecency. And on the latter, Mr. Chairman, I'll simply say that he knew it when he saw it. Uh, that is it for me, and I thank you very much for your indulgence. Thank you. Commissioner O'Reilly? Uh, no, uh, I just uh, also want to uh, recognize and give grateful thanks to two clerks who are leaving uh, our office. Uh, Yena Wadajo uh, is not here today. She's already had to uh, go back uh, to Georgia to prepare for her Georgia State Bar uh, exam. Um, she's graduating from uh, American University Washington College of Law. Um, and um, we really, uh, having Yenu on board was terrific because before she went to law school, she was actually an on-air personality, and so she knew broadcasting from uh, inside. Um, and so we're grateful to Yenu for all that she did. Um, present today is John Gaspari, who you will recognize from the bow tie, because John always participated in that tradition that somehow seeped into our office of bow tie Friday and um, and John is uh, upholding that uh, today he's currently a law student at uh, George Washington um, commissioner he is originally from South Carolina extra points he can't be all bad jeez um, <laughs> John has been a, a, a dive-in guy who has been involved in multiple uh, projects and was always, hey, John, listen, can you help us with this? And we're grateful to him uh, for that. Uh, he graduates uh, in about a month, a month from today, right? A month from today, wow. And uh, we'll be studying for the uh, Virginia Bar. Uh, John, 
thank you for all that you have done. Farewell and good luck. I'd also like to do point out one other thing for the record, and that is that uh, tomorrow is the birthday uh, of the um, secretary of the Federal Communications Commission. Okay, today, today, I am misinformed. I am misinformed. Happy birthday to Marlene. Thank you. Who we must always point out, prepared for the great job she is doing as secretary of the FCC by attending the Ohio State <laughs> University. <laughs> Happy birthday, Marlene. <laughs> and if there's nothing else... One th I'm so sorry. I did forget something, I promise. You're not going to make quick. something about no, no, no. And where she went to school. Are oh, you? no, I like Marlene, notwithstanding her education. <laughs> <Okay. but>, uh, <laughs> no, I, I did want to, I forgot to mention, uh, Doug Sandifer, the Office of General Counsel, recently retired. Anyone who has been on this dice for the last several years knows <laughs> how absolutely critical Doug is to the functioning of this agency. He, he's the classic FCC employee, somebody who knows the ins and outs of ethics rules and the financial disclosure rules and communicates thoroughly yet patiently with uh, nominees who constantly badger them with questions or incomplete forms. I w speaking simply for myself, I'm sure none of you had this issue, but uh, as I understand it, he's fly fishing currently in North Carolina, but if and when he comes up for air, I hope he knows that uh, he has the appreciation of a great many people at this agency for his service to the commission. Sorry. He's fly fishing, we're here, who's smart? I, exactly. <laughs> Madam Secretary, on this great and glorious day, would you please tell us about our next meeting? Absolutely. The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Thursday, May 21st, 2015. Thank you very much. Today's meeting is adjourned. Hello, everyone. We're about to start the press conference. If reporters who are interested in participating could take their seats at the table. Can all others who are not staying for the press conference please take your conversations out to the hallway, please? Thank you. Only three? Come on, guys. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Smaller crowd today. All right. The chairman will uh, say a few words, and then we'll open up to your questions. So in keeping with the uh, dispatch of the meeting, that's the length of my uh, topper here, folks. So uh, this is a uh, – and the point that I want to make is this is a historic time uh, at the FCC when it comes to spectrum management. You know, earlier this week, uh, I saw some of you out in uh, Las Vegas as I spoke to the nation's broadcasters about the first in the world incentive auction, which will allow market forces to determine the highest and best use of spectrum. Yesterday, we had the Model Cities workshop with NTIA to explore new ways to address spectrum sharing and new challenges we face there. And moments ago, we took another step towards more efficient and innovative uses of spectrum by leveraging new sharing rules and technologies to free up 150 megahertz of spectrum for broadband. The Commission's work to allocate and license spectrum in new and novel ways will deliver massive benefits to consumers, innovators, and our economy. And with that, I look forward to any questions you may have. Let's see, which end should we begin on? All right. He called it, Paul. Whoa. It's well, a rather assertive position to take, isn't it? Huh? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Paul. Um, so I have a, a transparency question. This weekend uh, in Cambridge, Maryland, TIA is having their annual spring summit dealing with policy issues. There's two bureau chiefs and two other front office people and other bureaus who are speaking, but the event, as it has been in the past, is closed to the press, just the attendees, lobbyists, that kind of thing. I guess I wanted to get your opinion about why you think that would be a good thing that so many FCC people would speak to a large gathering that's close to the press. 
uh, I'm unaware that the meeting was even taking place. Brendan. Uh, I wanted to, you know, the lawsuits were filed about the net neutrality rules. I want to get your thoughts uh, on that. And specifically, uh, one of the arguments that's being put forward is about um, this issue of uh, proper notice. Uh, so I know that there was some talk about uh, doing another further notice on net neutrality, and then you didn't do that. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, if whether you what you think about that argument and whether we'll have to start all over on this issue. So let the record show that Brendan is sneaking in two questions. <laughs> In, in one. I figured someone else And we at least first. picked up on it. Um, no, Brendan, uh, we have stood here before, me here, you there. We have talked about the big dogs we're going to sue. It is no surprise. Um, we have also heard repeatedly uh, the, uh, the process uh, allegations being made. Um, that is no surprise. Um, we feel very confident um, on both the processes that were followed and the uh, conclusions that were reached and that they will be upheld by the courts. Mario. Uh, can you update us on the, uh, the FCC's internal procedure review that you announced at a hearing last month? Yep. When do you believe that uh, it's going to be finished and do you expect any substantial changes in, in FCC procedures? Well, I don't know the answer to the the last part of the question uh, because I don't know what the results are. Um, every commissioner's office has now identified one person who will be working with Diane Cornell um, and uh, who will be heading up this task force, as I announced. Um, and the first step is to reach out to the agencies that are similarly situated to us to do an analysis of what their procedures are. And that also includes that there has to be, you know, an identification of exactly what the questions are, and that's the process that we're in right now. Brian. Hi, Mr. Chairman. How are you? Uh, um, wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the public notice um, that you're going to be rolling out on the LTE unlicensed issue, and yeah. um, can you sort of give us an idea of what kinds of questions you're interested in asking and, and that kind of thing? Well, we want to be learning from them. It's it's uh, so so going through the standards process right now is is this licensed assisted access technology, this concept right now because there's not a standard. Um, and um, and how that interrelates with our uh, spectrum activities, writ large, um, is an important question. And so what we want to do in the PN is say, okay, this is not yet a standard. <laughs> But what are the issues that are being de developed in the standards process? How are those going to relate to policy kinds of issues that we have to deal with? And, and, and you'll note that I said in, in my statement that not only was it for the purpose of informing ourselves, but it was for the purpose of informing each other. Okay. D Sorry. Do you share Commissioner Clyburn's concerns about interference with uh, with Wi-Fi? Well, I think the key thing is that's what we're we're putting out a PN to build a record on this whole thing. We make decisions here based on the record, Lydia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you provide any more details on the modified broadcast incentive auction rules uh, you announced at NAB? Uh, not at this point in time, Lydia. I uh, I indicated uh, at NAB. Um, that uh, we would be coming forth shortly um, with um, a package of auction rules, and I indicated that we understood the message that simpler is better. Brooks. Any uh, idea on the timetable for both the Comcast and the AT&T DirecTV review? That clock's been stopped for a while now. Um, the answer, do I have any idea of the timetable? Yes. Would you tell us what it is? <laughs> no. <laughs> Todd. Todd. Uh, hi, Mr. Chairman. Todd Shields, Bloomberg News. Will the commission grant or deny the, um, the uh, discounts and licenses apparently won at the AWS3 auction by DISH and the associated entities? Oh, golly, I think there's a process, as you know, Todd, that, goes, uh, that, that we go through there. Um, the, the first step is that the Bureau collects all of the relevant 
information uh, post auction, um, then uh, that information is uh, is is made uh, uh, available as the in, in what's called you know accepted for filing kind of a status, and then everybody has an opportunity uh, to comment on that, file petitions to deny, etc. And we're in the first stages of that. We we uh, and so it will proceed. So how would you like that process to end up? We'll build a record. We will make a decision based on the record, based on the facts. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Are you going to the White House or Ohio State? Bet yours. <laughs> <laughs> Um, are there questions for the Bureau on the uh, 3.5 item? Okay. Um, so if the Bureau could come up. Paul? So it's a uh, trap. I'll ask a question first. Um, so I want to double check a couple of things. Is it correct the the breakdown of PAA and G, uh, PAL and GAA is is 80 GAA and 70 PAL? Uh, yes, that's okay. a the short short breakdown. And then um, so one of the commissioners mentioned this. It might have been the chairman. I don't remember, but the 3650 uh, or 3700. Someone said, "Well, we're glad that uh, Commissioner Pye can continue to offer service. Why that transitions? Can you give us?" So, so that would allow them to continue to offer service, and then what's the transition period in that band to the new regime? Yeah, yeah so, um, you know, whenever you transition from one radio service to another, you have to, you know, take care that the uh, people doing the transitioning uh, are um, accounted for and, and able to make the transition in a uh, smooth way. So um, we've uh, made numerous provisions in the rules. Uh, first, so that once the after the transition happens, uh, uh, these operators won't be left with stranded equipment and will be able to keep um, providing service. Um, second, uh, during the transition, they will receive uh, increased protections for uh, uh, five plus years, um, so that they can. Um, uh, uh, continue to provide operations while the SAS capability turns on and is able to protect them. So does that mean the transition is a five-year period? It's or? at least five years. It depends on the length of the remaining uh, term on, on, the, on the license uh, of the incumbents. Okay. And then um, so another commissioner mentioned this, the I believe it was O'Reilly. Oh, yeah, and the last thing is they can they can, they can can continue operating the band after the transition. It's, it's, uh, but we hope that they will transition into – uh, take advantage of the new flexibility and uh, technology that comes with the uh, the bigger band uh, to to provide even better service after the transition. Are they WISP specifically said we should be grandfathered? Are they grandfathered? They're grandfathered for the limited time period. Right for the transition period. Yes. Okay. Um, and I guess it was Pi that said uh, the 20 megahertz. That was for the con contained access facilities. That is not in the order. That is right? correct. Okay. Uh, and then. Uh, this would be for Julie. Um, uh, as you know, NAB raised some issues specific to this proceeding, and then Google responded about, well, if you're going to have a database here, you're having database problems, NAB says in the TV white spaces. Do you want to respond to their, their argument and give us any updates since the hearing a couple of weeks ago about how the TV white space database issues are being resolved? So, so let me take them in turn. On the white space database, uh, we believe we've uh, corrected – all of the uh, missing information that was in there and eliminated where, for example, I think one of the criticisms that there was a, a handful of entries for John Q. Public. So that's all been done. We're continuing to work with the database providers to strengthen uh, authentication of registrations, new registrations into the database. And we've put the NAB petition, which asks for geolocation to be built into these devices, out for comment. On 3.5, uh, one of the things we did is uh, strengthen the provisions 
to guard against uh, those kinds of incorrect entries. And we've encouraged uh, where we have some limited provisions for, for professional installation, the industry to uh, set up criteria for people who are doing, and, and, and for example, a training program for people who are doing professional installation. Okay. Thank you. And then, obviously, you have I just had one thing that sure. you should feel free to, to quote me as Johnny Interference in the uh, when you in your write up. No, you're not. I, <laughs> I'm quoting you by your hand by your CB handle, Luke Skywalker. Right. Uh, and then the last question, obviously, you have editorial privileges. Is the goal to get the item out today, or is that not likely, just because it's a big item and it's kind of complicated? That's, it's not likely to come out today, but it'll be okay. soon. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody.